Hello, my name is Claire, and welcome back to Green Living Podcast. This week's topic is greenhouse gases. In this podcast, I will chat about what greenhouse gases are, where we produce them the most in the U.S., and how to help reduce our emission of greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases are gases in the Earth's atmosphere that trap heat. The gases let sunlight through the atmosphere, but prevent the heat from leaving the atmosphere. This effect is just like a greenhouse, hence the name where it lets sunlight in while preventing heat from leaving. Greenhouse gases are good to be able to have the life we have on Earth today. Without them, the Earth would be too cold for us and other organisms we know. However, due to human activity, we have increased greenhouse gases released into the air, raising the temperature at an unnatural rate of change. I wanted to chat about the top five greenhouse gases. The first is water vapor. This is water in gas forms such as steam coming from a boiling pot of water or water evaporating off of a lake. It forms clouds and rains which can cause a cooling effect. The next is carbon dioxide. This is carbon and oxygen or also known as CO2. It is naturally all around us. It can come from decaying and living organisms An example of CO2, it is a byproduct of cell metabolism, which is carried through the blood to our lungs, which we then breathe out. The average person produces two pounds of CO2 each day. The next greenhouse gas is methane, and this is carbon and hydrogen. It is a gas that is naturally from wetlands, from raising cattle, mining coal, and is flammable and is used as fuel. The next greenhouse gas is ozone, and a lot of people know it as the ozone layer, and it blocks the sun's radiation, which helps protect us from ultraviolet rays. And a lot of people might commonly hear about ozone holes, and an article from National Geographic says ozone holes are popular names for areas of damage to the ozone layer, This is inaccurate. Ozone layer damage is more really like a thin patch than a hole. So it seems that greenhouse gases are breaking down the ozone layer, but they're not actual holes. They are just thin patches of the ozone layer. And the article about the ozone layer is really interesting from National Geographic, so I'll make sure to link that. The next greenhouse gas is nitrous oxide. Nitrogen oxide is a natural part of the nitrogen cycle, and it can be found in bacteria and soil, and the ocean also makes it. The next greenhouse gas is chlorofluorocarbons, and according to NOAA, which is the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, are non-toxic, non-flammable chemicals containing atoms of carbon, chlorine, and fluorine. They are used in the manufacture of aerosol sprays, blowing agents or foams, and packing materials as solvents and as refrigerants. CFCs are classified as halocarbons, a class of compounds that contain atoms of carbon and halogen atoms. And CFCs are safe to use in most applications and are inert in lower atmosphere. However, they do undergo significant reactions in the upper atmosphere or stratosphere. And in 1974, two University of California chemists, Professor F. Sherwood Rowland and Dr. Mario Molina, showed that the CFCs could be a major source of inorganic chlorine in the stratosphere following their photolytic decompositions by UV radiation. So in addition, some of the released chlorine would become active in destroying ozone in the stratosphere. As I mentioned before, ozone absorbs harmful ultraviolet radiation and a loss of stratosphere ozone results in more harmful UVB radiation reaching the Earth's surface. Chlorine released from CFCs destroys ozone in catalytic 
reactions where 100,000 molecules of ozone can be destroyed per chlorine atom. In another article from Britannica, it also talks about those two University of California chemists in their research, and it said that CFCs once released into the atmosphere accumulate in the stratosphere where they contribute to the depletion of the ozone layer. Stratosphere ozone shields life on Earth from the harmful effects of sun's ultraviolet radiation, and even a relatively small decrease in the stratospheric ozone concentration can result in an increased incidence of skin cancer in humans and genetic damage in many organisms. Ultraviolet radiation in the stratosphere causes the CFC molecules to disassociate, producing chlorine atoms and radicals. And the chlorine atoms then react with ozone, initiating a process whereby a single chlorine atom can cause the conversion of thousands of ozone molecules to oxygen. I next want to talk about sources of greenhouse gas emissions, and this is specifically in the U.S., and this is according to the EPA, which is the United States Environmental Protection Agency. According to their research in 2018, transportation was the largest emission of greenhouse gases, accounting for 28%, and it is the sector generating the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels from our cars, ships, trains, and planes. Over 90% of the fuel used for transportation is petroleum-based, which includes primary gasoline and diesel. The next highest emission was electricity production, and this was at 27%. Electricity production generates the second largest share of greenhouse gas emissions. Approximately 63% of our electricity comes from burning fossil fuels, mostly coal and natural gas. The next is industry. Greenhouse gas emissions from industry primarily come from burning fossil fuels for energy, as well as greenhouse gas emissions from certain chemical reactions necessary to produce goods from raw materials and the industry was 22%. The next is commercial and residential, which accounted for 12%. This comes from businesses and homes, primarily from fossil fuels burned for heat, the use of certain products that contain greenhouse gases, and the handling of waste. The next is agriculture, accounted for about 10%, and this is greenhouse gas emissions from livestock such as cows, agricultural soil, and rice production. The last is land use in forestry, which accounted for about 11%, and land areas can act as a sink, absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere or a source of greenhouse gas emissions. In the U.S., since 1990, managed forests and other lands are a net sink, which means that they have absorbed more CO2 from the atmosphere than they emit. Emissions and trends in the U.S. Since 1990, U.S. gross greenhouse gas emissions have increased by 3.7%. From year to year, emissions can rise and fall due to changes in economy, price of fuel, and other factors. In 2018, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions increased compared to 2017. And the increase in CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion was a result of multiple factors, including energy use due to greater heating and cooling needs due to a colder winter and hotter summers in 2018 compared to 2017. So to me, that also indicates climate change and how we are actually burning more fossil fuels because it is getting cooler or hotter in the winter and or summer. So next I wanted to talk about carbon footprint. So a carbon footprint is the total greenhouse gas emissions caused by an individual, event, organization, service, or product expressed as carbon dioxide equivalent. So it is important to note that large companies are the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. These companies burn the most fossil fuels such as coal, gasoline, natural gases, and oil. And if a lot of large companies were to look at alternatives ways of getting energy, greenhouse gas emissions would go down drastically. And personal emission of greenhouse gases 
is accountable for a large percentage as well. So every little bit counts. And if a mass amount of people were to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, it would make a big change. And we also need to make sure that large companies are looking to alternative ways of getting their energy because they are the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. So how can we as individuals reduce our personal greenhouse gas emissions? I have a few tips that I have done and have researched, and then I'm also going to read a few tips from Columbia University. So my first tip is grow your own as much as you can. So whether that be vegetables or having a herb garden inside, this will save on food miles. And food miles are how many miles a food needs to get to travel to you. And having a herb garden or vegetables or fruit in your backyard, as long as you're able to grow them, will cut down food miles drastically. The next is get a home audit. So a company can come out and tell you what your greenhouse gas emissions and your consumption of energy is and give you an audit. The next two options are not attainable for most people, and I understand that they are both very expensive, but if you are in a place or maybe make this a goal to be able to do. So the first is purchase a hybrid or all-electric car, and the next is purchase solar panels for your home, or you can look into a rental house or if you're renting apartments and see if they have solar panels, or you can talk to the landlord or office manager about ways that they get their energy from and maybe if they've done an audit or maybe ask them to do an audit of their greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption so you can feel better about renting or living in that space. So these next tips are from Columbia University and I will link the article as well. They are categorized by food, clothing, shopping, home, transportation, and politics. So the first in food is eat low on the food chain. And this means eating mostly fruits, veggies, grains, and beans. Livestock, i.e. meat and dairy, is responsible for 14.5% of man-made global greenhouse gas emissions. So this is mainly from feed production and processing and methane that beef and sheep belch out. Every day that you forego meat and dairy, you can reduce your carbon footprint by 8 pounds. That's about 2,920 pounds a year. The next in food is choosing organic and local foods that are in season, transporting food from far away, whether by truck, ship, rail, or plane, uses fossil fuels or fuel, and for cooling to keep foods in transit from spoiling. And that's what I mentioned as well. If you can't grow it in your yard or have an herb garden inside, just shopping as local as you can because, again, of that transportation makes up a huge amount of greenhouse gases going into the environment. The third for food is buy foodstuffs in bulk when possible using your own reusable container. I know due to COVID, a lot of stores are not allowing us to bring in our own bags or containers, but making sure that when we are able to take them in again, that we are using our reusable containers. The next for food is reduce your food waste by planning meals ahead of time, freezing the excess, and reusing leftovers. The next is compost your food waste if possible. And I know that there are some cities that have compost drop-off sites. So making sure that you research if your city or area has a compost drop-off site if you do not have your own personal compost. The next category is clothing, and this is something I mentioned in the greenwashing episode is don't buy fast fashion. So trendy, cheap items that go out of style quickly get dumped in landfills where they produce methane as they decompose. Currently, the average American discards of about 80 pounds of clothing each year, which 85% ends up in landfills. In addition, most fast fashion comes from China and Bangladesh, so shipping to the U.S. requires the use of fossil fuels 
So instead, look to alternatives like buying quality clothes that will last and trying to thrift as much as you can if you are able to. And the next is something I just meant it mentioned is buying vintage or recycled clothes at consignment shops. There are so many websites now that are consignment shops online, or you can use Facebook Marketplace, or you can use so many websites. The next for clothing is washing your clothing in cold water. And it says the enzymes in cold water detergents are designed to clean better in cold water. Doing two loads of laundry weekly in cold water instead of hot or warm water can save up to 500 pounds of carbon dioxide each year. The next category is shopping. So the biggest tip for this is just buy less stuff. As much as you can buy used or recycled items whenever possible. So the next for shopping is bring your own reusable bags when you shop. Again, due to COVID, we are not allowed to. However, I have been opting to get paper bags instead of plastic. That will help a lot because I've been able to reuse those paper bags for projects or storing things in my house and I'm not bringing plastic into my home. The next tip for shopping is try to avoid items with excess packaging. The next for shopping is if you're in the market for a new computer, opt for a laptop instead of a desktop. Laptops require less energy to charge and operate than desktops do, which is something I did learn from this article. I did not know that. The next for shopping is if you are shopping for appliances, lighting, office equipment, or electronics, look for Energy Star products, which are certified to be more energy efficient. I have mentioned Energy Star products before in that greenwashing podcast, so making sure that Energy Star products are actually more energy efficient because, as I mentioned in that podcast, some companies were cheating to get that Energy Star report, so you just have to make sure that you do your research when purchasing appliances. The next for shopping is support and buy from companies that are environmentally responsible and sustainable which is what I love and what I am trying to do in my life. So the next category is home. So as I mentioned before, do an energy audit for your home. This will show how you use your waste energy and help identify ways to be more energy efficient. Next for home is change incandescent light bulbs, which waste 90% of their energy as heat. So change it to light-emitting diodes, which is LEDs. Though LEDs cost more, they use a quarter of the energy and last up to 25 times longer. They are also preferable to compact fluorescent lamp or CFL bulbs, which emit 80% of their energy as heat and contain mercury. The next tip for home is to switch lights off when you leave the room and unplug your electronic devices when they are not in use. The next for home is if you are able to, to install a low flow shower head to reduce hot water use and this can save 350 pounds of CO2 and also trying to take shorter showers helps as well. The next tip for your home is to lower your thermostat in winter and raise it in the summer. Use less air conditioning in the summer instead opt for fans which require less electricity. And the last tip, if you are able to do so, sign up to get your electricity from clean energy through your local utility or a certified renewable energy provider. A website that is greene.org, that is G-R-E-E-N-E.org, can help you find certified green energy providers. The next category is transportation. So because electricity increasingly comes from natural gases and renewable energy, transportation, as I said before, has become the major source of U.S. CO2 emissions. An average car produces about five tons of CO2 each year, and this can vary according to the type of car and its fuel efficiency and how it is driven. So making changes on how you get around can significantly cut your CO2 emissions. So the first tip in transportation is to drive less. So walking, taking public transportation, carpooling, rideshare, or biking to your destination whenever possible. This helps reduce CO2 emissions and also lessens traffic congestions and the idling of engines that accompanies it. The next tip for transportation 
is if you need to drive, avoid unnecessary braking and acceleration. And some studies found that aggressive driving can result in 40% more fuel consumption than consistent calm driving, which is something I learned from this article that I thought was really interesting. The next tip for transportation is to take care of your car. Keeping your tires properly inflated can increase your fuel efficiency by 3%, and ensuring that your car is properly maintained can increase it by 4%. Try and remove any extra weight from your car as well will help. Next tip is when doing errands, try to combine them to reduce your driving. And use traffic apps like Waze to help avoid getting stuck in traffic jams. On longer road trips, turn on the cruise control, which can save gas. And use less air conditioning while driving, even if it is hot outside, if it is safe to do so. So a subcategory in transportation is air travel. If you fly for work or pleasure, air travel is probably responsible for the largest part of your carbon footprint. This tip, according to Columbia University, is to avoid flying if possible. On shorter trips, driving may emit fewer greenhouse gases. Or try to fly non-stop since landings and takeoffs use more fuel and produce more emissions. Or go economy class. Business class is responsible for almost three times as many emissions as economy because in economy the flight's carbon emissions are shared among more passengers. First class can result in nine times more carbon emissions than economy. And the last tip for air travel is if you can't avoid flying, offset the carbon emissions of your travel. And if you don't know what carbon offsets are, it is an amount of money that you pay for a project that reduces greenhouse gases somewhere else. If you offset one ton of carbon, the offset will help capture or destroy one ton of greenhouse gases that would otherwise have been released into the atmosphere. Offsets also promote sustainable development and increase the use of renewable energy. In this article, there is a calculator that is from myclimate.org that you can estimate your carbon emissions of your flight and the amount of money needed to offset them. So an example that they have in this article is flying economy round trip from New York to Los Angeles produces 1.5 tons of CO2 and it costs $43 to offset this carbon. You can purchase carbon offsets to compensate for any or all of your carbon emissions as well. The money you pay goes towards climate protection projects. Various organizations sponsor for these projects. So an example, the My Climate, as I said before, which is the calculator, funds the purchase of energy-efficient cook stoves in Rwanda, installing solar powers in the Dominican Republic, and replacing old heating systems with energy-efficient heat pumps in Switzerland. Another company is COTAP which is sustainably planting trees in India, Malwe, Mozambique, Uganda, and Nicaragua to absorb CO2. You can sign up for monthly offsets there. And the last one in this article is TerraPass, which funds U.S. projects utilizing animal waste from farms, installing wind power, and capturing landfill gas to generate electricity. And this also offers a monthly subscription for offsets. So all of those links are in this Columbia article, which is very helpful. The last tip from this article is get politically active. And this perhaps is the most important since the most effective solutions to climate change require government action. So make sure to vote, become politically active, and let your representatives know you want them to take action to phase out fossil fuels, use and decarbonize the country as fast as possible. So those were some tips to help reduce personal greenhouse gas emissions. I am really interested to do some more research about offsets, about carbon offsets, and looking into those companies. I really found the My Climate very interesting that they fund the purchase of energy-efficient cook stoves and installing solar panels and replacing old heating systems with energy-efficient pumps. I find that to be really interesting and something that I would want to support. And the final thing that I wanted to leave you on with greenhouse gases is there is an article from The Guardian that lists the top companies that emit greenhouse gases. It's a very interesting article and something to keep in mind. 
So that's going to wrap up this episode of Green Living Podcast. I can be found on social media sites such as Twitter and Instagram at Green Living Pod. That's at G R E E N L I V I N G P O D. I will also link greenlivingpod.com. And something I mentioned in the first episode that I have not touched on since is I started collecting my plastics for a month. So I've been taking every single use plastic that has come into the house and I have been putting them in a container to see how much plastic has been coming in. And I <laughs> I took pictures of it yesterday and I counted it all out. And honestly, it's quite embarrassing how many plastic pieces have come into my home. It's quite embarrassing how many plastic pieces have come into the house because the past few months I really have been making an effort to not purchase things with plastic in them, but it's crazy how many things still came into the house. Now, I'm not living alone, so there are some things that have been purchased over the past month that I personally would not have purchased, but I still included it into the plastic count because it is coming into the house. So, the grand total for plastics for the past month, so about mid-August to now mid-September, was 119 pieces of plastic. I will be posting photos of this. I counted every single little piece of plastic that did come into the house. It's just an astronomical number. I was hoping for at least under 50, but unfortunately we had to put up some curtains and we had some other things come into the house that were unexpected. And so with that, came some plastic pieces that I was not expecting and a roommate ended up moving out a few months ago and so we ended up taking some things out of the bathroom and there was a pla huge plastic shower curtain that was in there that I did end up counting in the plastic count because it was in our lives and it's sitting <laughs> in our room right now and it haunts me because it is so much plastic. So I'm taking that 119 pieces of plastic, and if I multiply that by 12, that is 1,428 pieces of year, which is absolutely insane and makes me very sad because I have made a lot of choices in the past few months to try to reduce my plastic intake. So to think that this is what my plastic intake is after putting in certain things in place, that it is still such a high number, but it is a good baseline and something to work towards being zero plastic. <laughs> so I did want to mention that because I know I mentioned that in the first podcast and I will be posting all of my photos and a uh, write-up about my month-long plastic intake on my blog. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>